Hello everyone and welcome to Biohackers Lab. I'm your host Gary Cohen and on today's episode I have Dr. Paul Mason. Dr. Mason is a sports and exercise phys- um, physician out of Sydney, Australia and he was here at Low Carb Denver where we are today and uh, also got to speak at the Carnivory Con. So Paul, thanks for coming on. It's awesome to be with you. Yeah. And we're going to be talking about the talk you gave at the Carnival Conference which was about lectins. Yeah. And it was fascinating. So just to give people a little bit of insight why I find it so fascinating is because he mentioned one part where these things, which we'll explain now what are lectins, they can actually cause Parkinson's. That was fascinating. And they can can do this traveling around your body. So before we get into that, can you just explain to listeners what are lectins? Yeah, well, uh, fair question. So Lectins is, uh, I'm sure people have heard of Stephen Gundry, so he's sort of made a big, uh, a big deal about it with his book, The Plant Paradox. And it's based on the whole premise that there's these proteins that are mainly in plant foods that can bind to certain uh, carbohydrates, so they're carbohydrate-binding proteins, and they can be absorbed across the gut through various mechanisms, usually related to leaky gut, and then when they get inside the body then they, uh, they do all kinds of mischief. So basically it's a protein that's found in a plant, um, not only in a plant, but the most deleterious ones are from plants, and they bind to proteins and they muck around. Um, so I guess that's what a lectin is, the formal definition. But with Parkinson's disease, I mean, that was I probably threw that up there quite early on just to grab people's attention because it sounds so crazy. Mm. So basically... This chemical, if it gets absorbed across the intestinal wall, it can actually then go into a nerve called the vagus nerve and travel up to the brain. And it travels up to the brain um, that's affected in Parkinson's disease and it can affect something called dopaminergic neurons and lead to a deficiency of dopamine, which is the underlying cause of Parkinson's. So if you think about it, you've got your stomach, then you've got the vagus nerve coming up from the stomach, extending up to the brain, and you've got this little lectin that can travel up, <laughs> travel up this vagus nerve. And I, when I first heard this theory, I thought, oh, man, that's crazy. <laughs> there's, there's no way. But then you have a look at the data, and it's really compelling. So, I mean, they did this Danish study where they got everybody um, who'd had a, a procedure where they actually cut these nerves, the vagus nerve, completely uh, because they're done for other reasons like trying to treat reflux and God knows what else. But they got everybody in Denmark who'd had that operation between 1972 and 1995 and they followed them up for about 35 years and they compared them to a control group and they compared the rates of Parkinson's disease and they found that was a 47% reduction in Parkinson's disease if you'd actually had these nerves cut. And it's like, well, you know, that, that's kind of supporting, but sort of doesn't really seal the deal for me for such a crazy theory. And then I went having a look at these animal studies, and they actually gave a P-lectin to dogs, and they did what they made it immunofluoresce. So basically they attached a molecule to it that makes it light up. And so you can actually see where this P-lectin goes. And then they, they gave it to these dogs, and then they... Uh, uh, they euthanized the animals and they had a look at the brains and they were able to find this P-lectin was actually attached to the dopaminergic neurons in the brain. And these dogs developed Parkinson's disease. And then they did the same thing, but before they did that, they snipped the vagus nerve. And the dogs that had the same P-lectin, but without an uh, intact vagus nerve, they didn't get Parkinson's disease. So I was like, holy moly, these lectins, there's, there's got to be something in that. Mm. Yeah, and so when, when we're talking about this too, which is fascinating, it's not that if you have plants, you're definitely going to get Parkinson's disease though. No, 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 that's true. So uh, you raise a really important point because, you know, everybody's eating peas, right? <laughs> <laughs> or, you know, wheat and these kind of things. Whilst they're listening to this right now. But, <laughs> but we don't all have Parkinson's disease. And I think genetics plays a big role. And I mean... If we have a look at another lectin disorder, which is prototypical of a genetic condition, that's celiac disease. So we know that's gluten or more to the point a gliadin intolerance, and that's another lectin. And when we have a look at the genetics, 
there's a gene called the human leukocyte antigen and there's a particular a DR variant which is associated with celiac disease. And it's so strongly associated that more than 99% of people with celiac disease have this genetic variant. So genetics plays a huge role in, uh, in these conditions. And in actual fact, I like to think of it, I, I used to work in occupational health um, and when an accident happens, we always say, well, you know, what defence was there against that accident happened? Say if somebody fell over, you know, was the water on the floor? Was the lighting bad? What, did they have slippery shoes on? Were they tired? So we have layers of defences. And with regards to autoimmune diseases or Parkinson's disease, for instance, that requires you to have the wrong genes. It requires you to also have lectins in the diet. And it requires you to have an increased intestinal permeability, otherwise known as leaky gut, so those lectins can actually be absorbed in your body. So if you think about you've got three layers, think about like three layers of paper and they've got a hole in the middle of each paper, you'll only have the accident happen if all of those holes line up. Mm -hmm. um, if you only have two, two deficiencies in the defences, you might be eating peas and you might have leaky gut, but you don't have that genetic susceptibility, then probably you're not going to get that. So it's a, certainly what we call a multifactorial condition. Mm -hmm. And when we're talking about lectins again in plants, and, and you said it's not just in plants, um, do all plants have lectins? So I, I guess I don't know for sure. I, I couldn't say for sure, but I do know that there's over 119 plants that have been identified with lectins um, pulled from them. That's a minimum. So Probably there's plants without lectins, but I wouldn't know what they are. Mm. There's certainly some lower lectin plants. So if you listen to Stephen Gundry, there's a few plants that he tends to recommend as being low in lectins. I don't know if he ever uses the term devoid of lectins. So yeah, I'm not, don't know mm. exactly whether, don't know the answer to that one. Okay. And, um, but some common foods, uh, you mentioned peas. Are there any other common uh, foods that you yeah, think well, people Yeah, well, that's actually, eating? so peas are you know, legumes, obviously. So legumes come up a lot. And so a lot of people don't realise that peanuts and cashews are also legumes. Um, some of the vegetables, the nightshade vegetables in particular, so your potatoes, tomatoes, uh, what you guys call bell peppers, we call capsicum, um, chilies, uh, you know, these, uh, the eggplant, uh, they're very rich in lectins. Uh, the lectins are often concentrated in the seeds of these and in the skin. And that makes a lot of sense if you think about them evolutionarily from a plant point of view because they don't want to be eaten. So they want to protect um, the, the reproductive parts of the plants, which is why they're often uh, uh, concentrated in the seeds. So some of the strategies that you can do if you peel your vegetables, de-seed them, and then make sure you cook them, in most cases, that will actually reduce the lectin levels okay, pretty so, significantly. So the preparation, there is, you can sort of avoid getting a big dose of lectins through preparation yeah. process. Yeah, I mean, there's lots of examples of this. So take, for instance, uh, soy. So if you have natto, which is fermented soy, so the process of fermentation actually reduces the lectin content significantly because we know the soy lectins are some of the most harmful ones. Um, so seeding your food, so spouting your, sprouting your food will actually reduce lectins as well. If we take um, kidney beans, for instance, so they've actually got uh, red kidney beans have something called phytohemagglutinin, and that's one of the most toxic lectins that, that you can actually have. It, it's a prototypical one. And it's been shown that if you just have four raw kidney beans, that's enough to possibly put you in hospital with nausea and vomiting and diarrhoea. Um, there's been multiple case studies and reports of that in the medical literature. So the recommended um, method for reducing kidney bean lectins to a safe level, or just reducing it, not eliminating it, <laughs> is to soak them for five hours and then to boil them vigorously for at least 10 minutes. Yeah. Um, but there is a bit of a caveat with that, and that's a bit of a, an aside, but some studies have shown that if you just heat them up to 80 degrees rather than boiling them, then that could actually potentiate the effect of the lectins within them by about five times. So you really, I mean, you know, it's, a, it's almost Russian roulette with kidneys, <laughs> kidney beans. So, uh, yeah, so anyone who's out there and loves their kidney beans, it's, as you said, that's, a, that's an interest. Is it all well, kinds of kidney beans? Or well, like? I, I, don't, I think kidney beans are their own variety. I mean, it, it's most kind of beans. I mean, so 
you look at castor beans, we don't eat them, and there's a good reason because that's where you get ricin from. You know, that, that's a nerve agent, a nerve toxin. They use it, uh, you know, it's been used militarily in the past. Yeah. And what about baked beans? You know, people in the UK or, or Europe, they love their baked beans. Uh, do you, are they an issue? Yeah, I, I actually don't know where, so they're the ones in the tomato sauce, yeah. aren't they? I actually don't know what, what kind of beans they use for that. Whether Is that I, broad beans or are they too, too small for that? Yeah. I, I don't know what yeah. kind of bean. But in general, as a rule of thumb, beans and legumes are mm. lectin rich. Now, some of them have worse and more harmful lectins than others. Um, but for my money, I mean, I, I don't eat them. Okay. And do you get different types of lectins then? Yeah, yeah. So because the lectins are protein that binds to a carbohydrate and it binds with a lot of specificity. So it's not going to bind to every everything it comes across. Now, the reason it's important, we probably should say, with a human cell, you've got on the outer membrane of it, you've got these little uh, glycoproteins. So it's called glyco because it's got sugar in it. So a little protein with a little carbohydrate, a sugar cap. And they're very specific. And certain lectins will be able to bind to the glycoprotein on certain cells. So if we have a look at wheat germagglutinin, for instance, that will bind to the glycoproteins that lie in the, the blood vessels and damage that. If we have a look at um, P lectin, then Obviously, from the study we talked about with Parkinson's disease, that's got a strong affinity for dopaminergic neurons. So they must have a um, – the glycoprotein on those neurons um, must have a good affinity for P-lectin. So, yeah, they, they do, they're very specific and they cause different conditions. So there's a, several other um, examples of quite what I consider unique conditions they cause. So. You would have heard how you go on a low-carb diet, you lose a bit of weight, and your reflux disappears. Now, the reason it does that is because there's a lectin, and well, there's actually more than one, there's at least three lectins that have been studied that do this, that actually bind to a cell in the stomach called a mast cell, and they bind to IgE molecules on the mast cell, and they cause it to release a chemical called histamine. And that histamine then generates acid secretion in the stomach. And that's why when you go on a low-carb diet, very, very rapidly, the reflux goes away. It's not because of the rapid weight loss. It's because when you cut out low-carb foods, you're also cutting out a lot of the foods that are rich in lectins. Fascinating, yeah, because, I mean, that is heartburn is a condition that a lot of people would say got better when they lowered their carbohydrate mm. intake, and they thought, oh, it's just the carbs. It's yeah. like carbs as general, but we're, you're trying to say don't just look at the carb, look at actually it's this thing called a lectin. So Eric Westman did a brilliant study <laughs> Um, several years ago, where they actually got esophageal probes down here sitting in the esophagus measuring the acidity level for 24 hours. And they did that before and after six days of a very low-carbohydrate diet. And they had a massive reduction in the level of acidity. And, uh, you know, that's just that's well in advance of significant weight loss. We used to theorise, oh, it's the reduced abdominal mass pushing the acid up and all these. But mm. it's clearly the benefit is far too rapid for it to be that. And it... The, uh, the mechanism where we see the lectins actually stimulate acid release, I think, elegantly explains it. Yeah, and, you know, that just gets me thinking when I meet people, well, I know I've, I've experienced myself, if I eat a certain food, it might give you severe heartburn. Um, and this could be another part of the explanation of the type mm. of lectin. Or so the a lot of people get that with tomatoes, right? They're very rich in lectins. So that's, uh, that's not a coincidence. Fascinating. Okay. Um, and I like it. So because we have different types of lectins, you you know if maybe you are affected by this because you may be exhibiting different symptoms or as you were mentioning, different types of conditions. Mm. Um, are there any other symptoms that you would think would to you would indicate that someone maybe is um, being affected by well, lectins? Well, there's two, uh, I guess there's, I put things in two broad classes. So I think metabolic effects and autoimmune effects so, I mean, autoimmune effects can affect everybody. It's probably easier to start with the metabolic issues. Mm. But I don't know if you've had any carnivores on your program, but often when people eliminate plant foods from their diet, they experience a profound weight loss. Um, and I've seen it in patients. They lose more than 10 kilos. And this is transitioning from a ketogenic diet that's already low carb to another ketogenic diet. So what explains this? profound weight loss. And it's because lectins can actually stimulate the insulin receptor. 
And they've actually done some beautiful studies where they actually had a look at the conversion of carbohydrate or sugar molecules into fat, and they measured the rate of that conversion. And then they had a look at what happened if they um, put in insulin or if they put in lectins or if they put in lectins plus insulin. So what they actually found was that when they put in insulin, the fat conversion was here. But when they put in lectins on their own, the fat conversion was way up here. And when they put in lectins plus insulin, it was still up about here, just a tiny little bit higher. But the lectins were shown to stimulate the insulin, or basically the creation of fat, in a way that was a bigger amplitude and more prolonged than insulin was. So that's the number one mechanism why lectins can contribute to weight gain. And the second one is leptin. I don't know, you would have heard, if you heard of the leptin-resistant mouse or the leptin-deficient mouse, you, did, you see two pictures, you've got a fat mouse and you've got a skinny mouse. So if leptin's not working properly, basically you get fat. And we call that a state of leptin resistance. And the presence of lectins, L-E-C-T-I-N-S, is able to block the binding of leptin, L-E-P-T-I-N, on its receptor. In effect, it induces a state of leptin resistance. So you've got two potent forces there that we know cause weight gain, and they're both increased by these these chemicals, these carbohydrate binding proteins. So, you know, if you're on a ketogenic diet and you're struggling to lose weight, you know, it might be worth trying to cut some of the lectins out. Yeah, and that's what I love about this. So, you know, people will go more low carbohydrate for various reasons and typically weight loss is a big reason, you know, carrying extra pounds or extra kilos. Yeah. And I love this idea that this is another problem solving tip because you are going to have people who plateau or stall and they get frustrated thinking, no, but I'm already very ketogenic. I eat mm. a lot of fats or yeah. my ketones, ketones are so high. I don't understand why I can't get rid of these last few pounds. And this is a potential. Well, it really is. So I, I do food diaries. If I, a patient comes in, I'll say, well, you know, just show me what kind of foods you're eating. And we'll often see, so capsicum, and bell peppers and tomatoes are really common low carb foods. And it might be the only thing they're eating. That it could be nuts. Um, you know, the, the amount of people, I'm actually personally, I'm surprised at the number of patients who still have a soy latte. I mean, there's no redeeming features of soy at all. <laughs> it, it's Up until 20 years ago, it was an industrial waste product. And they made this big, you know, hula bar when they actually figured out how to process it in a way that meant that you could actually get a little, access the protein a little bit. It's basically... It's junk, and it's actually very rich in lectins as well. So, for instance, um, one study they did on endometriosis, so it was a group of females with unexplained infertility. They just couldn't fall, fall pregnant. So as part of their investigative workup, they actually took a sample of the inside of their uterus, the lining called the endometrium, and what they could actually find in those females with the infertility, they actually found these lectins were actually binding, they, they were lining the uterus. And funnily enough, so I think I mentioned before that gluten and gliadin is actually a lectin. When they put females on a gluten-free diet um, with unexplained infertility, things for a lot of them, a large percentage, I can't recall exactly what it was, but I think it was more than half, actually got better. And so... And again, I think this also speaks to your comment before about the specificity of lectins. So because they bind to a specific sugar, um, specific glycoprotein on certain cells, and every cell expresses different glycoprotein. So some lectins we'll see in the endometrium, some of them we'll see in the brain, some of them will be on the nerve. You know, God and, knows what they're doing. And that's why a patient or someone could have a variety of symptoms. So we're not, it's not like you all, always get a skin rash and you it's, yeah. it's like yeah, obvious. Yeah, yeah. So in this case, it, it could be that you just you can't you've got this extra weight gain, um, you've got neurological symptoms of some sort to mm. a degree maybe, or even fertility issues, cardiovascular uh, disease because it binds to the inside of the heart vessels. It contributes. It's not a sole cause because uh, you know most most diseases like we said are multifactorial, but it's certainly a contributor. And then even joint pain. Have they found yeah. Have they found these lining joints at all? Do Look, you know? I'm trying to recall. I did remember looking up the uh, synovium. Um, we do know um, from our studies 
that people that go on gluten-free diets and low lectin diets, they actually have an improvement in their joint pain. I'm not sure whether that's due to direct lectin binding or just an autoimmune response, an inflammatory response. Mm -hmm. um, but certainly people do um, significantly improve in joint pain. And that's probably a good point to bring in glucosamine. You know, the supplement that every man and his dog takes for arthritis. Mm -hmm. So we've studied it. It's been literally hundreds of studies have been done on glucosamine. And there's never been any convincing evidence that it's beneficial for osteoarthritis. But it's still the most popular joint supplement you can get. And the reason is because there's millions of people who take it who swear it helps their pain. And here's why. Because when we, the, first of all, the research doesn't find any positive findings because they exclude people with an inflammatory type of pain and they want to only include people with a mechanical type of pain. So before you join a study, you have to have an x-ray of your knee and that proves that you've got this wearing down of the cartilage and you have to have an absence of inflammation symptoms. And unfortunately, they're the kind of people it's not going to help at all. Because it's actually got a sugar on it, glucose amine, if you ingest that at the same time as having lectins, then the lectin can bind to the glucosamine and the glucosamine in effect acts like a decoy receptor. It means that that lectin can then not bind, it can't be absorbed and bind to your cells or anything like that. So I guess thinking about it like that, um, that's actually the putative mechanism for glucosamine helping. Now, is it reducing an inflammatory response with the inhibition of the binding or is it reducing binding directly with the internal aspect of the joint? So I'm not sure exactly. But it's certainly um, that's – and I've read that in a couple of articles. Um, and uh, to me that mechanism makes perfect sense and it explains what we see clinically where patients come in swearing that the glucosamine helps and the studies are saying – you know, I'm sitting there with a patient, I'm saying, I'm sorry, this paper says that it, it can't help your pain. Uh, you must be wrong. You don't really feel better. I mean, there's this disconnect there. Yeah. I, I've never even thought about that process that you, if, say, someone's trying to eat a healthy diet because they've got joint pain and they're mm. trying to feel better, but actually they could be exposing themselves to lectins, which is making them worse. And then if you take a glucosamine supplement, it could make you feel better, but it's because yes. the glucosamine's Attaching with the it, lectin? It, yeah, the glucosamine is binding to the lectin. It's take, It's meaning the lectin then can't bind with whatever else it will in the body. Yeah. So it'll be bound and hopefully it'll just be excreted out. And this is why, and this is actually one of the really, uh, if you follow this through to the logical conclusion, people on a low-carbohydrate, high-lectin diet, so if you're a vegetarian on a low-carb diet with no sugar, then you might be exposing yourself to more lectins because there, we do know, and there, there are studies showing this, that in mice they've actually looked at what happens to their systemic absorption of lectins with and without sugar. And the sugar, the sucrose they were used in this study was definitely shown to reduce the systemic absorption of the lectins. So now, not a human study, I grant you that, but, I mean, just on the basis of what we understand about the biochemistry of it, I think it's reasonable that that would hold true in humans. And, you know, it, it makes you wonder whether we should be recommending low-carb diets in vegetarians. That also gets me thinking, again, problem-solving, where there's going to be a certain sect of people who go ketogenic and they, again, notice some changes, but they can have abnormal symptoms or things that get worse. And in this case, again, it could be that if you've got this lect... I don't know, can you use the word lectin sensitivity or... Um... Yeah, I don't know. I mean, there, there's such a protean you know, manifestations. I, suppose, I mean, I suppose you could. I mean, because genetically we know some people are more susceptible to the effects mm. than others. You take a Michaela Peterson, um, you know, if she looks at an olive, <laughs> um, you know, it, it's going to disagree with her, um, whereas other most people won't have that degree of sensitivity, so it's probably a fair call yeah. to say that. Yeah, no, I'm just, again, thinking how it's fascinating that you would go maybe low-carbohydrate, ketogenic, and you're still trying to have lots of leafy greens, or some, mm. but it could actually be a, a contributing... Counterproductive. Yeah. It could be increasing your symptoms, and especially if you understand that some, some lectins might contribute to activation of the insulin receptor and leptin resistance. 
Um, and you're going low carbohydrate because you think you have insulin resistance too. Mm. And it's, yeah, it's a, it brings it, a whole new element I'll to this. You, it, it blew my mind. It absolutely blew my mind when I first came across this. Is, uh, the way it started is I, I had patients come in and they'd talk to me and they'd say, you read this guy's book, Stephen Gundry. I'm like, no, I haven't. No. And then eventually it's like I had two or three patients ask me. So I was like, okay, I've got to go and read this guy's book. And I disagree with the uh, – I actually went and looked up a lot of the science for some of the statements he makes because it's not very well referenced, um, first of all. So you sort of – there's a lot of faith in taking – a lot of his statements, and I think a lot of his statements are not supported by science. But the general premise that lectins are harmful to us, I think, is well, you know, that's well, well substantiated. And mm-hmm. um, he's also the main focus, I guess, in his book was autoimmune disease. And um, so I'm not sure uh, if you've ever talked about autoimmune disease with your listeners before. Yeah, well, I've had Michaela on. So, okay. Yeah. I mean, the general concept of an autoimmune disease is that your immune system, which is meant to be knocking out pathogens, starts to, it's a case of mistaken identity, and they see the cells of the own body as being something they want to knock out. So the immune system starts to attack your own body. Mm. And the lectins can actually do that through a process called molecular mimicry. So if they get absorbed through the gut, um, and the immune system gets exposed to it. The immune system might want to go, oh, we don't like you. We're going to mount an immune response against you. But it doesn't mount an immune response against the whole lectin. They mount a response against something called an antigen or a, a particular molecular signature. This is, you know, maybe a few amino acids long. Now, it just so happens that on some of those lectins, that molecular signature is the same molecular signature that you might see on a healthy human cell. Now, every cell is a bit different. A liver cell is different to a muscle cell and so on, Um, which is why we have specificity for autoimmune diseases. So we have families, so you can have a thyroid autoimmune disease, you can have a muscle, you can have one affecting your kidneys and so on and so forth. So you get these lectins, you generate a uh, molecular mimicry response. Basically, these, uh, these immune cells and antibodies that have learnt to identify lectins as foreign they'll now have a case of mistaken identity and they'll come after you. And I find that absolutely fascinating. And if you have a look at, um, we talked about celiac disease before or gluten intolerance. And what was actually, if you sorry, if you celiac disease and type 1 diabetes, and we know that having celiac disease significantly increases the risk of type 1 diabetes and vice versa. So autoimmune diseases come in families. And there's some really nice evidence too that the gluten is actually a driver of both processes. So if you get diagnosed with celiac disease, your risk of subsequently developing type 1 diabetes is far, far lower. And that's logical because what's the first thing you do when you get diagnosed with celiac disease? You go on a gluten-free diet. So the the driver of the disease, so gluten or gliadin is one of the main lectins driving the autoimmune process in diabetes. So eliminating that out of the diet will reduce the risk of um, transformation. And furthermore, they did this really elegant study in mothers and they looked at what happened. They compared their gluten intake with the rate of development of type 1 diabetes in their offspring. And they found that compared to the group of mothers consuming the lowest level of gluten, the group that were consuming the highest, their offspring had double the risk of developing type 1 diabetes. So I think that's uh, quite compelling to say, yeah, these uh, these autoimmune diseases, um, there is a link. Mm-hmm. The, the, the mechanisms are explained. We've got molecular mimicry. We've got the epidemiological data. We've even, to an extent, got some uh, I- interventional data um, where they've actually uh, looked at the rate of, uh, say, we take uh, a biopsy of the kidney in somebody with a condition called glomerulonephritis, and they actually measure the level of antibodies, these circulating immune components, before and after a gluten-free diet. And what do you know? They fall. Uh, the, the tissue levels of the antibodies are far, far less once you simply cut wheat out of a diet. Yeah. So... Uh- Again, it's, it's, I love it that um, people have these practical tips that if they are struggling with something, 
it makes sense just to give a gluten-free diet a go, but it's not just, don't just think about the gluten. There's all these other benefits that come with it. Um, but now, you, you mentioned something about intestinal permeability earlier, where, you know, the Swiss cheese where everything's got to line up. Yeah, yeah. So when we've seen it on the carnivore diet, when I've had different guests talk about that, that even their digestive system changes here. Do you think then... Um, someone who is more low carbohydrate or keto, that if they're still getting some sort of digestive systems, this potentially could be a reason they should test maybe for a period of time of trying to just minimize even that and going all meat for a period of time? I mean, I guess it, the all meat diet's been described as the ultimate elimination diet. I mean, I think that's a term frequently used. I mean, for my mind, it's obviously hard to give any firm recommendations, but if anybody's having symptoms that are otherwise unexplained and they think that something they're eating might be causing it, well, I, I think you have to do an elimination diet as the most effective means of figuring out what that something is. And certainly if it's a short-term period, I don't know of anybody who's ever been harmed by doing uh, restricting plant foods for a short period mm -hmm. to, to see if they might be causing any of their symptoms. Mm. I'm just thinking of practical ways now that someone who's concerned that they've got leaky guts, that um, yeah. what, I mean, other than going all meat then and reducing your exposure to lectins, would, uh, well, my would you have any other suggestions? Yeah, so um, my clinical approach is we can actually measure leaky gut. Um, we can do a test. Um, basically, we give you two sugars. Um, but well, there's several ways of doing it. One, you can use a molecule called polyethylene glycol. The other one is to give two sugars. Um, you give a big sugar that's not normally absorbed, that should just go in the mouth and come out the other end, and you do a small sugar that should totally be absorbed. And then the small sugar that sh should be absorbed, if we take a urine sample six hours later, we should be able to detect it in the urine, but we shouldn't be able to detect the big sugar. Mm -hmm. And then if we detect this larger molecular sugar, then that tells me that the spaces between the cells lining your intestines has actually opened up and allowed this larger molecule to pass in. So that's actually quite a reasonable test for intestinal permeability. There's another one that I really like. It's called fecal culprotectin. And that is derived from a cell, uh, an inflammatory cell. It's a white blood cell called a neutrophil. Um, but it's very specific for the intestine because it's a fecal sample we measure it in. And if that's elevated, then that gives me a strong, strong clue and it, it correlates really tightly with intestinal inflammation. And I think one of the key points here about autoimmune diseases is that almost all of them have increased intestinal permeability at their heart. So I came across a, a genome-wide analysis study um, that placed inflammatory bowel disease at the centre. So that's a prototypical inflammatory intestinal permeability condition. It contains Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. And what they actually found, so you've got this disease in the centre and in this genome-wide association study, you've got all these spokes coming out to 23 other different conditions, most of them which were other autoimmune diseases. So it really just shows you how tightly linked. If you have inflammatory bowel disease, your risk of having, you know, 23 other conditions was also increased. And in my mind, I, I, I would uh, put forth that that increased risk relates significantly to the increase in intestinal permeability. And that is that what actually allows the lectins to then access the immune system and you can get this molecular mimicry response and um, your tissues are starting to be targeted by your own immune system. And I mean, IBS or irritable bowel syndrome is so prevalent out there and it goes both from constipation to diarrhea and people they struggle with it they think is it just psychological is it this well, is IBS it so we have to dis distinguish between inflammatory bowel disease IBD and IBS okay um, so and the easy way to distinguish between that would be to do a fecal culprotectin or an intestinal permeability. We can also do a test for what we call fecal reducing sugars so irritable bowel syndrome, I think is more of a condition where you have some carbohydrates especially but also sugar alcohols which don't get absorbed by your intestines and instead they, they track down to the distal part of your colon where the bacteria in the colon can ferment them. And as a part of that fermentation process, they produce gas. Um, 
and some of that gas may be methane, which actually reduces the movement of the wall. The fact is that you get a bit of bulking out um, can sometimes lead to feelings of constipation, um, especially if the gas is produced early in the small intestine, then it, it's not able to wind through the wall and escape easily. So you feel really bloated, like you need to pass something. So you have sensations of constipation. But because they're um, what we call osmotically active molecules, little sugar molecules, they actually attract fluid to them as well. So they give you watery stool. And that uh, really explains why you get these mixed symptoms of constipation and diarrhoea, which on the face of it doesn't make a lot of sense. You, you sort of think, well, they're, aren't they mutually exclusive? Mm. It should be one or the other. But no, you, if you actually understand the mechanisms, you can actually have this sense of constipation um, and slowing of the what we call peristaltic motion, the, the muscular contractions at the same time that you've got liquid stool. Mm. Um, so you touched on it a little bit early on in our conversation that lectins aren't plant exclusive. Mm. So you do get lectins elsewhere. Well, yeah, so you actually have a lot of what we call animal lectins as well, seed heart lectins and things like that, and possibly um, in foods as well. But it's not really clear how significant they are in terms of causing symptoms. So I'll give you one example. There was one study that looked at um, 16 different lectins, including plant lectins and animal lectins, for their ability to cause the release of histamine uh, from the mast cells, the thing that leads to reflux. And there was four of the lectins they found that led to a significant release of histamine, and they all happened to be plant-based lectins. So it's a bit, I can't sit here and say that plant, uh, animal lectins aren't a problem, but I would pretty confidently say that plant lectins are likely to be a bigger problem. Mm -hmm. they're, they're more likely culprits in the situation yeah. from what we can see. And then, because that's again, is another interesting thing where some people feel that they can eat certain meats, but they can't eat others. W would this even come into play that animal lectins is, is a factor well, look, here? Possibly, but it could also be the antibody response, and we're sort of going to be trundling around through the weeds there. Um, but essentially, if you imagine, so when you get a flu vaccine, your body that your body generates these antibodies that are very specific for hopefully the flu virus. And the reason you need a different flu vaccine every year is because it changes absolutely every year. And if there's a slight change in the flu virus, and this antibody's not going to recognise last year's strain, it. it will only recognise, or hopefully it will recognise this year's strain. And if we actually have a look, if you have an autoimmune condition, then you've got a lot of these antibodies circulating around. And there's some really nice research that's been done in the last couple of years where they've actually looked at antibodies that are found in common autoimmune diseases and they've tested them for cross-reactivity against a lot of different products, including different types of meats. So, you know, a, a mackerel, a salmon, an egg, a white and an egg yolk and a beef and just basically all different kinds of foods. And the surprising finding was that not every meat product reacted the same. There was a, a there was a, they contained what we call the antigens within the meat or there were substances within the meat that could cross-react with these antibodies commonly found in certain autoimmune conditions. So I suspect when people have an intolerance, once, once you've already developed an autoimmune condition, I think then you could propagate your symptoms by eating foods that then react to the antibodies that you have present. Um, so it, it's a little bit convoluted. Uh, I'm not, I don't think it relates to lectin so much as an antibody response. Mm -hmm. But yeah, so it's just, uh, again, I'm finding this whole lectin world fascinating it's just another element to when people are trying to problem solve and say what is it exactly that's causing all my symptoms well it's really it's given me a, a really good tool because <coughs> I, i'd see patients i'm a clinician and i'd come in and they'd say i'm doing keto and i haven't lost any weight i'd say right let's go through your food diary count the carbs have a look at this do your bloods how insulin resistant are you and i mean you know quite not infrequently so we can help most people but we would draw up blanks with the standard paradigm. And what I'm seeing is that when we actually deal with the lectins, um, quite often, so I like to do antibody testing now, so these uh, these little antibodies which are, will be generated in autoimmune disease, they're the main way that we actually use to diagnose autoimmune diseases. And I can test for over 100 different antibodies 
um, there, there's I get the pathology manual out, I can just flip through it to my heart's content. It's fantastic. And the most common antibodies I detect are against the thyroid, um, which will be consistent with a condition called Hashimoto's thyroiditis. And if I see these antibodies, so what I'm finding is that people who come in with these sluggish types of metabolism, their TSH, their T3, their T4 might be absolutely fine. Um, even the reverse will be absolutely fine. But once we uh, look, see the presence of antibodies, it's like you need to go on a lectin-free diet. And then we see the benefits. So for me, uh, you, you talk about the problem solving, it's just given me another string to my bow. This, mm. was, this was what was missing from my clinical practice. Um, and having this in my arsenal, being able to test for intestinal permeability and being able to test for anti the presence of antibodies and a lot of these what we call subclinical autoimmune diseases, which just really means that they're not so overt that we can diagnose them. But I don't really believe they're subclinical because patients are feeling symptoms, but they're just sort of vague enough and non-specific enough that we can't diagnose it. Mm -hmm. And so, of course, some people are going to be listening to this. Well, they're going to be all around the world and they might not be able to see you directly in Australia. Um, is there something that you would suggest that they say to their local family physician or, or doctor then to help them to know if they, because you just talked about two different types of tests that you could do in your practice. Mm. Look, it depends on test availability. And I don't know in America, you know, there's a hell of a lot of issues with insurance and being able to get whatever test done. If your doctor doesn't agree, um, then good luck. <laughs> And I don't know how you get around that. Um, but certainly, I think that if you want to establish if you're, uh, you have an issue, so you can do a fecal colprotectin, you can do an intestinal permeability test, and you might either want to do a, uh, what we call a PEG 400 or a, uh, a polyethylene glycol, and 400 just refers to the size of the particles, or a, a double sugar method. There's a couple of different sugars you can use, as I described before. You can also, in some labs, get something called a serum zonulin, which means uh, the chemical zonulin in the blood. And this is actually probably really relevant. Now, we haven't touched on it yet, but the mechanism of leaky gut, um, zonulin actually plays a big role in that. And it's actually one of the main causes. And if we detect the zonulin um, in your serum at high levels, then uh, that tells us that you've probably got leaky gut and um, gives us a good clue as to the cause. So basically, if you imagine the intestine is lined by cells, a single layer of cells that are all joined together side by side, so sort of like that. Mm -hmm. And what the glue that's holding them together is these little proteins, and they're, they're called tight junction proteins. And zonulin is a chemical that gets released when by two main stimuli, by inflammatory stimuli and by gliadin, or the, one of the components of gluten. And that will directly stimulate the release of zonulin, and zonulin will come and basically destroy these proteins holding the cells together. And that's the main cause of leaky gut. So if we can detect zonulin at higher levels, that's also quite a useful test. Um, I don't know if there's uh, how available they are. Um, we're pretty fortunate in Australia. We've got some quite modern laboratories and um, you know, we've got access to these kind of tests and they often require an out-of-pocket, but they're not exorbitantly expensive and incredibly beneficial when you actually come up with something and especially when you know what to do about it. So previously, if we had a diagnosed leaky gut, we we probably would have been a bit vague about exactly what we do. And now we sort of, well, you know, there's avoid this, there's this supplement, you can do this. We know that you know, there's several factors. So emulsifiers in food, you know, with the exception of lecithin, emulsifiers destroy the lining of the intestine. So if you're having any food, the processed food, chances are that's going to be contributing. We know pollution. So PM10 um, pollution is particularly damaging to the lining of the gut. So something called titanium dioxide nanoparticles, something you normally hear about in sunscreen, well, that's actually used as a whitener in foods. Um, so you get a gluten-free, sugar-free chewing gum. It's probably got titanium dioxide in it. So we know that there's certain things you should avoid. So a supplement, like you can actually supplement with lecithin because um, that's actually got phosphatidylcholine in it which makes up about 70% of the mass of the mucus lining the gut. So if you take that, that can actually help restore the mucous membrane that protects the cells. 
um, lying underneath. So, you know, we've got these diagnostic tools now and now we've got these interventional tools. So as a clinician, it feels wonderful for mm. me to be able to say, I've done the objective test, you now need to stop eating this, this and this. These are some lifestyle factors, avoid the processed foods, pollution or, you know. And sometimes it's as simple as we've got people who live in a busy city and we've got a, a, a nice um, running path near, near us that's right on the edge of a busy road. And it's like maybe you shouldn't run on that path during peak hour traffic because we know that pollution that you're going to get from some of the diesel vehicles is going to make it worse. And so it's all these little little lifestyle factors and supplemental factors that make the incremental differences and people feel good. Yeah. I mean, yeah, that must be just so rewarding. And as you said, it's just you've got another tool in your toolkit there and mm. it, it's unlocked a whole new level for these these patients who feel stuck and, and they're like, yeah. I thought I was doing all right. I'm, I'm, I just don't know what's so, going on. I mean, on. we take, I don't know if you know much about chronic fatigue syndrome. And I say that sort of a bit tongue-in-cheek because nobody knows much about it. It's always been one of those conditions where we, we try and, you know, we hypothesise it's cytomegalovirus. It used to start out being Epstein-Barr virus, we thought, of course. And then it's, like, oh, it's actually more cytomegalovirus and, oh, it could be this, it could be, you know, uh, overtraining syndrome. The latest evidence is it's actually an autoimmune. And a lot of people who come in and they'll have symptoms that would be consistent with a classical diagnosis of chronic fatigue syndrome will get better when you deal with the lectin side of it. So, you know, yeah. it, it's uh, for a clinician because they're the kind of patients and look, yeah, I don't know how if I should be saying this, but doctors, we have what we call heart sync patients. And we call a heart sync because they walk in the room and your heart sinks. And it's not meant to be pejorative with a, a reflection of the patient's personality or anything like that, but it's the kind of patient as doctors, we genuinely want to help people. And we get frustrated when we can't. I mean, the pay, obviously, it affects the patients more. But, I mean, hopefully we're in this for the right reason. We want to make people better. And there's a couple of common presentations that traditionally are heart sink presentations because so fibromyalgia would be another one as on top of chronic fatigue that traditionally we just can't fix. Mm. And for me, I'm actually really enjoying these patients now because I feel that I can offer them some hope. And of course, it doesn't mean that you fix all of them, um, but the number of them that have significant benefits makes it all worthwhile. Mm. Yeah, and that's the reward again, that you were able to find something to help that person who was just in this stuck place for so yeah. long. Yeah. I mean, I, I honestly think this is a whole new frontier in medicine, and I can't wait to see what research is done in the next five or ten years. But it, it's quite exciting to sort of just sort of feel like you're at the, the cusp of it, the, the cusp of something new. Mm -hmm. And I, I like this too, this topic about lectins, it, bringing it to the low carbohydrate or ketogenic community is that it's not just about carb counting. There's no. these, these other elements that are... Well, when you see the impact, when you look at the, the impact that lectins can have on insulin receptors and stuff like that, you can say, well, it can't be just about the carbs. And it's not. Uh, you know, because if it was just about the carbs, there'd be no difference in weight loss on a on a vegetarian low carb diet and a plant free low carb diet. And clearly, there is. People lose massive amounts of weight when they reduce their plant foods, when they reduce certain plant foods. And this would also be of the calories in, calories out. So you could be having the same amount of calories on these two different diets, but it, it's it's still this. It maybe the lectins is the issue. Yeah. Here. So what it does, it changes energy balance. So I mean. Calories in, calories out, you can't get away from that. You cannot lose weight unless you burn more energy than you take in. That's a fact. Mm -hmm. But the calories in, calories out model, unfortunately, doesn't tell you how do you actually get your body to burn more than you're putting in. And this is fits perfectly in with that because if it's creating a leptin resistance or activation of insulin pathways, then that explains why you're not that's why you're going to be storing fat. It stops you burning fat. It makes you feel hungry. It explains both elements of the calories in, calories out. It tells you why you're putting too much in it. It tells you why you're not burning enough. Mm. So rather than just trying a descriptive model, um, let's go for an explanatory model. And, you know, if we understand the role of insulin, and carbohydrates has a big role in that. I'm not saying it doesn't, but I'm saying that we, we shouldn't deny the role of lectins in that process. Mm -hmm. 
Well, Paul, um, yeah, you, we've gone down a whole rabbit hole of different topics here, and I've loved it. But I've, I've also loved it that we've been able to go down that rabbit hole and come out and help so many people who are listening to this again. Um, for anyone who wants to follow you, keep in touch with you, do you have a particular social media or way that you would suggest people start, come to do that? I'm trying to get better on Twitter. So that's at Dr. Dr. Paul Mason. Um, we've actually got a website, lowcarbdoctors.com.au. So I actually run the metabolic clinic with a, uh, an Australian orthopod is a uh, orthopedic surgeon, Jeron Sher. And uh, we're trying to populate that uh, website with useful information. It's uh, more aspirational at the moment, but hopefully in the future we'll be able to have some videos up and some blogs and uh, a few little thought pieces. All mm -hmm. well, brilliant. And I'm going to link to all of that in the show notes. And uh, after being here at Low Cob Denver and listening to everyone who just wants to talk to you, uh, you've got to watch this guy. He's going to be a rising star, um, as everyone is saying. So again, Paul, thank you for sharing just a little bit of your treasure trove of knowledge. You are a massive library. And um, yeah, I found this really useful. Thank you. Look, it's been great to chat. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah.